All right, so um, I'm the head of citizen science at the museum, and so I do a lot of work with people to get them involved in scientific research that they can do regardless of their level of experience with science. Um, but I have training as an entomologist, and in particular, I worked on aquatic insects uh, before I came to the museum. And I love aquatic insects. I think anything that lives in water and does all these weird things are just the most amazing insects and I love them. So I'm very excited to talk about aquatic flies today. Since the bug fest theme is flies, I figured um, introducing you to some really cool aquatic flies can be a great way to get you excited about these amazing animals. All right, so let's talk about what an aquatic fly is, and hopefully you all can guess what this means. Um, they are flies that spend at least part of their lives in, on, or around water. And so they're ones that really need water to complete their life cycle at some stage of their lives. Uh, and so flies are a similar um, um, metamorphosis to some other insects, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, but let's think a little bit about why you should care about aquatic flies. One is that there are a ton of species. Flies are very, very, very diverse insects. There are so many flies. Uh, their beetles have the most and then flies are pretty much right behind them as far as the most species group of organisms and there are so many of them and even in the aquatic flies which is a small subset of the total flies in the world there are so many of those. So in the U.S. we've got about 5,600 species of them which is a lot of species of flies that live in water for part of their lives. They are everywhere. There are even species of flies that live in pools of petroleum. And you know that is what we make gasoline out of. That is a really weird habitat for a, a fly species to live in. Uh, so you can find these in dirty water, clean water, flowing water, still water, all kinds of salty waters. They're really, really impressive and have so many habitats that they can live in. I think aquatic flies are very interesting. They do some really weird and cool things and you'll learn about some of those things today. And some of them really suck, which is what I wanna talk about today. Uh, and so I'm thinking about this in multiple different ways as you'll see. Um, and this will be the focus of the rest of what I'm gonna talk about today. So I do wanna tell you that flies are what are called holometabolous insects. So they have, um, what's more commonly known as complete metamorphosis if you're not an entomologist. So they start off their life as eggs and then those eggs hatch into larvae. They molt multiple times so they get bigger and bigger every time they molt and then they turn into a pupa which is the same as the chrysalis stage for uh, butterflies and then those turn into adults and so they've got this four stage life cycle and in the aquatic flies the aquatic stages are usually among the first three. So a lot of them are eggs and larvae in the water, some are pupae in the water as well, um, or they can be in the water for all three. Most of the time though, the adults are gonna be on land. And so they're in water as immatures, and then once they get their wings and become adults, they are living on land out of the water. They might still be near the water because all this other stuff needs to happen in the water. So they meet near water, they spend time near water because the immatures need the water, but the adults are actually on land. All right, so I wanna talk today about some aquatic flies that really suck. But the first flies I wanna introduce you to are some that don't suck at all. And so let's meet the crane fly first. I love crane flies. They look like this as adults. Uh, they have really, really long legs. These legs break off so easily. Um, people see these all the time in the spring in North Carolina. There can be so, so, so many of these out. Uh, and a lot of people are really pretty scared of them. Uh, they have a bad reputation that is completely undeserved of being either blood suckers. Sorry, there's traffic in the background. Uh, so a lot of people think that they suck blood, that they're mosquitoes, um, but they're not. And a lot of people think that they eat mosquitoes, which they most they do not. Um, most 
crane flies actually have non-functional mouth parts. So they can't eat at all as adults. And the ones that do tend to feed on pollen or nectar. And so these are completely harmless to people, even though a lot of people are really scared of them. Um, they have, have that bad reputation for no real reason um, because a lot of them really can't, can't even feed as adults. But a lot of crane flies, not all species, but a lot of them have larvae that live in the water. And so their larvae can look something like this, where you have this kind of long fleshy body. These can be pretty big larvae, so they can be really meaty. Um, they have a head that is kind of pulled into their body. And so their head capsule is actually inside their thorax a little bit. Um, they can stick it out a little bit to eat. And then they have all these dangly bits in the back that are their um, respiratory surfaces. So there are some holes that are back here that they use to breathe through. And then um, they can absorb some extra oxygen through some of these, these bits at the end. And so a lot of these cream flies are gonna start off life in water. So you can see them around um, streams a lot of times and they are going to turn into those, those beautiful flies that you see here in the spring in very large numbers. All right, let's talk about non-biting midges. This is another insect that people mistake for mosquitoes all the time. Um, these are a different group of flies. So they look like mosquitoes, but they're a different group. Um, and as adults, they are completely harmless to people. These guys do not bite people at all, even if it looks like a mosquito. I find they like to hold their front legs up like this. So if you see an insect that looks kind of like a mosquito with the front legs held up like that, you're probably looking at a non-biting midge. And there's a lot of species of these, like hundreds and hundreds of species of um, these midges. And most of these are going to start off their lives in water as larvae. So a lot of these are called bloodworms. If you've ever heard of bloodworms or fed bloodworms to a fish or bought them um, for uh, animals, they are a fly larva that lives usually down in kind of mucky habitats in the bottom of either streams or ponds, depending on the species. And this red color is something that's really special in insects. Insects don't have uh, respiratory systems the way that we do. So when we breathe, we breathe into our lungs. And then we're moving oxygen from our lungs to our blood because we have a chemical in our blood that pulls oxygen out of our lungs called hemoglobin. And a lot of these blood worms have a chemical that's very similar to hemoglobin. It's not exactly the same as our hemoglobin, but it pulls oxygen out of the water into this fly so that it's able to breathe in these kind of low oxygen environments way down at the bottom of aquatic habitats. So they look red when you see them because they've got a chemical that they use to help them breathe as effectively as possible. These are really important food for a lot of other animals in aquatic systems. And so um, they're very abundant a lot of times when you see them. Some of them can live in really clean water. Some can live in really dirty water. There are so, so many species of these non-biting midges. All right. My favorite fly is this one. This is the moth fly. This is the adult. They are called moth flies because they look a lot like moths, but like the other flies, they only have two wings instead of four. Moths have four wings. Moth flies only have two wings because they're actually flies. And then they've got these kind of um, scaly wings like flies do. These are like moths do. These guys are awesome and you'll find them at lights at night. Um, you can also find them indoors and so a lot of times you might find them on the walls in your bathroom or you could find them at uh, your gym. There are a lot of places that you'll see these indoors and that is partly because their larvae which look like this um, can live in some pretty disgusting habitats. So a lot of times if you find only these larvae and nothing else, that's a really bad sign that the water is really, really dirty. These guys can survive some pretty impressive pollution. Uh, and they also really like some really kind of gross habitats. So in the bottom of your drains, you've got a U-bend 
and that collects water and a lot of skin cells and other things that you're washing down your drains. And these guys love to hang out in that kind of habitat. They like that mucky water in the bottom of your drains where all those fluids and those skin cells and everything gather and they eat all of that gunk in your drains. And so these guys will develop in your drains and then they'll come out of your drains as adults, which is why you see these flies in your bathrooms and in gyms. Um, they like to hang out in places where you have a lot of, a lot of fluids going down drains. Um, and so they can be kind of gross, but they're really beautiful and they're completely harmless to people. They can't do anything to you. And in fact, they're cleaning up your drains just a little bit. So I don't think it's a bad thing to have moth flies in your home. All right, another really cool fly that I really like are the phantom midges. This is yet another one that looks a lot like mosquitoes, even though <clears throat> they are harmless to people. They've got the same kind of fluffy antennae that you've got on the, the males and mosquitoes, the same kind of body shape. They're about the same size, but their larvae are very, very different. So they are going to look like this. They're clear, like very, very, very clear. And then they've got these weird modified antennae that they use to help them catch prey. So these guys are usually eating other little um, like Daphnia uh, water fleas and other things um, with these antennae that they have. And these are really, really clear insects. They're very hard to see when they're actually in water. In fact, this um, photographer, Jan Hamerski, does such an amazing job taking pictures of these. I mean, these are so hard to take photos of because they are completely clear. These insects are one of the only ones that can live out in the open water in ponds and lakes. Um, most insects that are going to be in ponds are gonna be near the shore where there's a lot of vegetation because they need places to hide because they get eaten by things like fish and frogs and uh, other insects. And so they really need places to kind of tuck themselves out of the way to stay out of sight. These guys are so clear that most things can't see them swimming in the water. And so they can be out in the open water where all those fish are and they do not get eaten in very high numbers because the fish can't see them in the first place. They use these little air bubbles that you can see here to help them move up and down in the water column. And so they um, can fill those up with air to go up and they can squeeze air out of those to go down. And so they can use that to kind of move them up and down. Um, but they're very, very clear and hard to see. So Chris, there's a question here yep. before we get too far away from the moth flies. Mm -hmm. Why are the antennae so fluffy? Oh, I am not sure how to answer that one. Um, <laughs> But the, the antennae are usually sense organs, and so I would imagine that they are using those to um, sense something in their environment, potentially food, or it could be um, looking for mates. So a lot of um, you know, females will give off pheromones and the males will use their antennae to find them. Um, but I'm not 100% sure why their antennae are so big. Thanks. All right. The last of my flies that don't suck at all are the hover flies. And you have probably seen um, some of these and not all of these are aquatic as larvae, but um, several species are. They are the flies that are gonna kind of hover in front of you. So some of them can be a little aggressive and get right in your face um, or they can just kind of hover out in the distance. But a lot of these are really important pollinators. They like to visit flowers. They're moving a lot of pollen around. Um, they are bee mimics or wasp mimics a lot of times. So a lot of people mistake them for those animals. But again, they only have two wings instead of four. Some species of these are aquatic as larvae and some of them that are have a larva that looks like this, which is called a rat-tailed maggot. Uh, it's a really unpleasant name. These guys live in really mucky habitats in the bottom of of ponds usually and then they stick this really long tail out of the water and use it like a snorkel. So they live in a habitat where there's not a whole lot of oxygen to breathe and so they use that tail like a snorkel to be able to breathe air at the surface and so they've got a really really long tail that sticks out looks kind of like a rat tail thus rat tail maggot uh, and they use that to be able to breathe in that really low oxygen environment that they're in. 
So um, both those blood worms that I showed you earlier with that hemoglobin-like chemical that helps them absorb oxygen and these, which have the really long tail to allow them to breathe at the surface, they're living in that really low oxygen environment down at the bottom of bodies of water where there just is no oxygen available and they're having to adapt their bodies to figure out ways to be able to breathe. I think these are so cool. I really love them. All right, so I wanna talk about two aquatic flies that do suck, but in a good way. So the first one are the long-legged flies. And the adults are really varied, but a lot of the ones that people see will look kind of like this. They've got really long legs, they're metallic green, have really huge eyes. A lot of these are predators, and so they are eating other insects, and they're really important for helping us control a lot of other insect populations, and they're um, performing a really important service in our environment. Now, not all long-legged fly larvae are aquatic, um, but there are several species that are. Um, and a lot of them are living near streams or in wet leaf litter that's near streams. And so they've got at least a semi-aquatic, if not completely aquatic, larva. Uh, the larvae look kind of like this. They're just kind of blobs. Um, <laughs> and then they've got some mouth parts um, on one end. A lot of these are predators as well. And so they're eating other insects in aquatic systems. So they could potentially eat things like black flies and mosquitoes and some other things that we don't necessarily like that much. Um, and they live in a um, variety of different aquatic habitats and then turn into those really beautiful, uh, very diverse adult flies that are hunting on land. All right, the net winged midges are ones that I really love. So their adults look something like this um really beautiful flies really long legs uh their larvae are so cool i think the larvae are just the best of all the aquatic fly larvae um, they are going to look like this on the top and they will look like this on the bottom and the reason i say these guys suck is because these are suction cups that they use to hold on to the rocks that they live on in streams so these guys like to live in usually pretty high flow environments so they're living right out on the open rocks in the middle of streams that have some pretty good flow if you're a very small animal in a really high flow area you are going to get swept off of any surface you're on if you don't have a really good way to hold on and so these guys use these suction cups to suction themselves to the rocks and they're actually really really hard to pull off of a rock it's it's a lot of work to actually scrape one of these guys off of a rock. They hold on so tightly and so these suction cups are helping them stay in place. All right, there are some aquatic flies that kind of suck. So they're kind of awful, but they don't exactly suck. Um, so horse flies are what I'm thinking of in particular. If you've ever been bitten by a horse fly, you know that these guys have super painful bites. And that is because they have a kind of razor blade like mouth part. So they actually cut you and they want you to bleed a whole lot really quickly because everything pretty much tends to swat them away as fast as possible. Their bite is very painful. So you don't really want them sitting on you very long. Um, so they make you bleed as much as possible, as fast as possible, so that they can suck up a little bit of that blood and then leave. Uh, if you have ever been bitten, they're really unpleasant. But these are gorgeous flies also. The eyes on horse flies are just amazing. A lot of them have stripes. I mean, they're really beautiful flies, even though they're not necessarily ones that we really like. A lot of horse fly species have aquatic larvae. And they are these big, big, big fleshy larvae that have um, little rings down their bodies. They move around in streams a lot of times. Their head is kind of tucked into their body um, like one that you saw before. And they are just kind of roaming around in those, those aquatic habitats as larvae is completely harmless to people, um, fleshy sex basically. Uh, and then turn into that really nasty blood feeding 
slicing fly as adults. All right, now let's talk about the aquatic flies that really suck. So these are the blood suckers. So they're the ones that actually suck blood out of your body. Um, and these are usually very unpopular flies for a lot of people. You all know mosquitoes. I'm sure you've all had experience with mosquitoes. There's a lot of mosquitoes in North Carolina, so you have probably seen one of these before. But here's a mosquito. They have scales on their bodies. They've got a long proboscis that they can use to suck blood. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't know is that only females bite um, people and suck blood. They're using the blood to help them with their reproduction and they have to have a blood meal to produce eggs properly. Uh, and so all female mosquitoes that reproduce are going to bite at least one person. But the male flies, the male mosquitoes do not bite people. Uh, they're mostly feeding on nectar and pollen. And the females themselves use that same source, that nectar and pollen, uh, to feed themselves. They're using that blood to reproduce, not to feed themselves. So these guys are roaming around on land as adults, but their larvae, which you probably all have seen also, are underwater. So you'll see them floating near the surface. They have a long tube that they stick out. So like the rat-tailed maggot you saw earlier, they've got a long tube that they use like a snorkel and stick that out of the water. They tend to float at the surface with their heads down. Uh, these guys are filtering water a lot of times. So they are um, kind of pulling water through fan-like mouth parts. And so they're pulling a lot of particles out of the water. And so they do have a little bit of a benefit to aquatic systems as well. The pupae look like this. So they transform from this into this. They also have little um, tubes that they kind of stick out to breathe and they tend to float near the surface. And so you'll see these guys near the surface in a lot of bodies of water. Um, these are something that a lot of people try to control historically. Um, so honestly, a lot of swamps that were destroyed or built over or um, a lot of kind of destructive environmental practices happen to try to control mosquitoes. Um, if you break the surface tension of water, mosquitoes can't survive uh, as effectively. So um, there was a lot of gasoline and oils and things poured on bodies of water to try to control mosquito populations and cause a lot of problems in different parts of the world. All right, and I really love this photo. Um, this shows a mosquito emerging from that pupa. So the pupa is floating near the surface and then the mosquitoes emerge out onto, onto land directly from the water. So they just pull their adult body out of that pupal exoskeleton and um, pump their wings up, harden a little bit and then fly away. All right, another fly that really sucks are the black flies, and the adults look something like this. Um, these are not quite as big of a problem as a biting fly in North Carolina as they are further north. So um, in Canada and the northern parts of the U.S., these can form really, really huge swarms, and they cause a lot of unpleasantness for people that live in those areas, um, and they're very, very unpopular in the, those parts of our, our country and the country above us. But their larvae are really cool. So they look like this. They're typically called bowling pin shaped. Um, they've got these big fans that they use as mouth part, or these are mouth parts. Um, they filter particles out of the water with these mouth parts. Uh, so they just kind of sit on a rock or a plant and hold those fans out and have water kind of flow over them to feed themselves. And then down here, they knit a little silk pad. And so that is what they use to hold on to their substrate, their rock or their plant that they're hanging out on. So they knit this little silk pad, attach it to the, the surface. And then if they get knocked off that surface, they let out a little silk string kind of like a spider would. And so they can kind of dangle out off their surface a little bit. You'll see, see them kind of like jiggling around in the water as the flow is kind of pushing them around. And then they can retract that silk thread back onto whatever surface they're on. So that helps them stay in place and not get washed downstream. Um, they're really, really cool insects. I think they look really, really interesting. 
And then as pupae, they look like this. So they've got these big gills um, or respiratory structures sticking off their um, off the top here, and they build this little kind of case that they sit in. And so they're they're latching themselves onto the rock or the plant with this little case, and then sticking these respiratory surfaces out so that they can can breathe while they're transforming into adults. All right, and the last one I want to talk about are the noceums, uh, and these are really interesting flies. So the adults look something like this. Um, these can, they're called noceums because they're really, really small and uh, they are an insect that can bite you and suck your fluids, but you might not see because they're so, so tiny. Uh, they're also called punkies sometimes. Now, not all of these bite. Some of them are not blood feeders, but the species that are can bite you a whole bunch of times in a very quick amount of time. Um, they can form some pretty big swarms and a whole bunch of them can get you at once. I know my personal experience with these is that I got 300 bites in 30 minutes. Um, standing out in the swarm of them once, it was very, very unpleasant. Um, but they are, they're out there in the world and um, they're definitely an unpleasant insect when you come into, come into contact with them, at least the ones that bite. The larvae are really interesting looking. They're really, really, really skinny and really long. Um, they are living down in kind of the same places usually that you find the bloodworms. Uh, so you'll frequently find these two kind of together. Um, but they've got these weird, very, very long, skinny bodies that turn into a little itty bitty fly as an adult. Um, some of these larvae are predaceous as well, so they're eating other insects in the water uh, and then others have other feeding habits, um, but some of them do actually help eat some other things in the aquatic habitats. All right, so I'm going to wrap up here by talking about why aquatic flies matter. Um, so there are a lot of aquatic flies that cause a lot of diseases and um, irritation to people. So they can bite us, they can transmit diseases that we definitely don't want, but there are reasons why we should care that these things exist. Uh, one is that they can tell us a lot about how clean a body of water is. So people all over the world collect insects out of bodies of water and can tell something about how clean that water is just by figuring out what types of insects are living in it. And flies are one of the things that tell us a lot about how clean a body of water is. Uh, and that's a really important role that they play for us as humans that also depend on water. They can be a really important food source for so many other species of animals. So if you like things like birds and bats and turtles and frogs, you need to like some of these aquatic flies because they are eating a lot of these things and they are really, really important in the diets of so many other species. Um, I personally am very into dragonflies. Dragonflies eat so many flies uh, and a lot of these aquatic flies. So they're eating things like mosquitoes and black flies and those noceums. A lot of them are pollinators. So they are actually transferring pollen between plants and helping them reproduce. Uh, and this is a role that flies don't get a lot of credit for, but they are really important as pollinators, at least some species of them. Uh, a lot of them can actually help clean water. So a lot of those um, fly larvae, the aquatic ones that have the fan-like mouth parts are um, pulling a lot of materials out of bodies of water and then transferring them into a different state. So they're taking these larger particles, chewing them up, eating them, sending them through their digestive system. And then what comes out the other side is useful to other animals um, in other ways. And so they can actually help clean um, kind of messy bodies of water to some extent. And then a lot of these aquatic flies are also helping control the populations of other insects. And so um, they can either eat them or they act as predators or as parasites. And so they're helping control a lot of populations of other species. So they can perform a kind of balancing um, role in our environment and help make sure that nothing gets 
kind of blown out of proportion that all the numbers of animals that we have on our planet are kind of about where they need to be. All right. I would be happy to take any questions, but I do want to point out three people that let me borrow photos uh, for this presentation. Uh, John Abbott, Matt Bertone, and Jan Hammerski. Uh, they're all amazing insect photographers and lovely people that I'm really excited to know personally. Uh, and I would love to thank them for letting me use their, their photos. But with that, I'd be happy to take any questions from anyone. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Everybody can drop uh, clapping hand emojis into the chat box. <laughs> round, round of applause in the chat for Chris. Excellent stuff. So I'll remind everybody, you can use the chat in order to leave questions, thoughts, uh, experiences. We had a couple of interesting uh, mosquito experiences shared by a couple of our viewers, Chris, that maybe you can comment on. The phenomena of swatting a mosquito as it's biting you and then seeing the contents of its guts spilled onto your skin. I have Hope definitely was done that. Breakfast. <laughs> yeah, so they've just they've just sucked blood out of you and you know you squash them and then they uh they spew their go, contents all over you if you squish them. <laughs> so um, it's always fun to be reminded that they are in fact sucking your blood. Um, you know, they have actually used mosquitoes too because, you know, it's really hard to actually feel mosquitoes biting you. So, you know, you swat them because you felt a little something and that's just kind of your natural response. But a lot of times, you know, this mosquitoes have been feeding on you for a while before you even notice that they're there. And there have been scientists that have used the mouth parts, the structure of the mouth parts in mosquitoes to develop more, um, more pleasant, I guess, injection systems for things like uh, vaccines. Because if you can't feel a vaccine, people are more likely to get them. Um, <laughs> and if we can mm -hmm. make the um, injection systems that we have more pleasant for people, that's just better all around. And so people have used mosquito mouth parts to help develop some cool technologies. Oh, really cool. I, I didn't know about the medical application of a mosquito bite. Biomimicry at its best. <laughs> We also had a question. Uh, one of our viewers was curious about how the noceums bite. Um, that I am less certain about. Um, so actually, you know what? There is one person that's on the call that I'm going to ask if he knows. Um, Matt, are you still on? Do you happen to know the answer to that question? You can let us know in the chat, I think. Mm hmm. How do oh, they buy? And hello. Perfect. <laughs> Go for it. Hey, Chris. Uh, hey, Matt. Talk. Welcome. Hey, Chris. Oh, Chris and Chris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <was>. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So they actually have um, really small blade like mouth parts, too. And uh, so when people get bit by punkies, especially near marshes and the beach, there's little tiny noceums, they hurt a lot for such a tiny, tiny thing. And yeah, so I can say that for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I know most people who go to the beach and they get bit by stuff and they don't know what it is. Um, they're tiny, um, less than about a millimeter long, uh, but they have tiny little uh, blades, just like the horse flies, but on a microscopic level. So they basically slice open the skin also, but it's so tiny that you barely even see it. You don't bleed much, but definitely feel the pain. I was curious too about the the different mouth parts between the noceums, horse flies, uh, and mosquitoes, and in the ways that they bite you. In what so regard? I guess noceums have blades, mm -hmm. mosquitoes have the little like needle that gets you. How do horse flies? Theirs is a blade. A little, they just and they right have a substantial blade, so they, they, they cut a pretty big hole. So no CMs cut a small hole. You can feel it. It's unpleasant, but it's a little less noticeable. Horse flies, they slice you well. <laughs> so that was a question. Uh, do they hurt? And 
mosquitoes, not so much. Horse flies, wow. And yeah. no CMs. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you definitely notice the no CMs. I mean, they're so small. It's impressive that they can hurt as much as they do because they are so tiny. And, you know, they're called no CMs because they're so small that you just don't see them. Um, but they are impressively painful. All right. Uh, let's see, when we were talking about moth flies, Shannon wanted to know would they make good pets? Well, they're very tiny, so you'd have to have <laughs> a really well sealed container. Um, I've never tried to raise one. Um, I would bet probably not, but I don't know. I've never tried. Um, I mean, people keep insects in labs all the time, and there's a pretty big insect rearing industry in the world. Um, so there's probably a way to do it, but I don't know. But they're so small. I mean, they're only a few millimeters long, so they're not a super impressive animal. It's not like having a really big moth or something that looks beautiful. Um, but the, the moth flies are so tiny that you can barely even see them. <laughs> You'd have to enjoy their fluffiness with a microscope. I mean, you, you can see them with the naked eye, but they are very, very small. And to see the actual like fluffiness, you've got to get really close. <laughs> All right. Going back to the beginning, how long does the adult crane fly live if it doesn't eat? Oh, they do not live very long as adults. Um, so a week or two, um, you know, they're using their fat stores from when they were larvae. So they get all their food as larvae. So they're eating and eating and eating and storing all, all that in their bodies. And then when they turn into adults, they're using the same, um, the same food that they gathered as an immature. Uh, so they don't live for very long because they run out of food eventually inside their bodies and then they can't, they can't go on. Now, what about uh, this distinction? Like you're talking about aquatic insects here and you talked about creatures that spend part of their life in the water and then they leave the water. There's also groups of insects that spend their entire life in the water. Are there ones that do the opposite? They're terrestrial and then they move into the water? There are a very few of those. Um, most of them are beetles. And so they will um, have their larval stage and the eggs on land. And then um, some of those will pupate in the water and then turn into aquatic adults, um, which is kind of a weird, a weird thing because usually it goes the other way. Most aquatic insects, if they're going to be terrestrial at all, are going to be terrestrial as adults and lar um, aquatic as larvae. But there are a few that do the other. The other way. Interesting, interesting. Uh, let's see, Eve is asking about disease causing or carrying flies. Ooh, yeah, so actually a lot of pretty nasty diseases are related to aquatic flies. So of course malaria is a really important one um, with mosquitoes. Uh, there's also yellow fever and Zika, um, encephalitis. Uh, <laughs> there, there's so many so many things that a lot of these flies can carry um, and they are a really big source of um, viral transmission to humans. So they can be a really big problem and um, because of that we end up destroying a lot of swamp and marsh habitats because we worry so much about the diseases that we can get from some of these animals that we just destroy the habitats that they live in. Um, but there's, of course, a lot of other things that depend on those habitats as well. So just getting rid of that habitat entirely maybe isn't the best approach um, because we're getting rid of a lot of other species as well. But because those flies are transmitting so many things um, or have the capacity to transmit so many things, um, we really worry as humans about those kinds of habitats and the, the places that they live. And it seems like too, for so many of these things like mosquitoes, for example, they can be pretty easily controlled just in your yard by avoiding, you know, artificially standing water, like buckets of, with water sitting out or, uh, yeah. you know, flower pots that just fill up and you don't empty. Yep, exactly. Well, and mosquitoes don't like um, flowing water really either. They don't like moving water. So you can buy for like, um, 
bird baths and things like that, these little shakers, it's just like a sometimes solar powered, sometimes battery powered. They just sit and they have these little legs and then they have this little vibrating thing that just kind of shakes the surface of the water. And that's enough a lot of times to keep mosquitoes from getting into a pond kind of situation that you have in your yard. So if you want to provide something like a bird bath, you know, just getting one of those wigglers can be enough to keep you from getting mosquitoes. And then of course there are also so many things that eat mosquitoes. So if you can get, if you have a backyard pond and don't have some way of moving the water, if you let it develop into this really nice ecosystem, you can get um, things like dragonflies and other things that eat the mosquito larvae. And so if you get enough species in your pond, that will take care of a lot of those aquatic flies that you might not want around too. Natural ecosystems can, can take care of themselves. Let's see, how are butterflies related to flies? Ooh, they are not very closely related. They are two completely separate orders. So if all the insects are divided up into 25 or 30 different groups, um, the flies are one group and then the butterflies and moths are another group. And so they are um, not that closely related. So butterflies have four wings, um, flies only have two. So they're very, very different in a lot of ways. Um, butterflies also have scaly wings and flies don't. Uh, and so they're, they're completely separate groups. Um, they are both holometabolists. So they have that complete metamorphosis, that four stage metamorphosis. So they're related in that regard. You know, they're more closely related to each other than either of them are to like the dragonflies or something that have a different type of metamorphosis, but they're not that closely related. Good question, good question. All right. Well, it looks like we hit the questions. Oh, no, there's another one. Kate wants to know in the pupil stage, are flies in a cocoon? Ooh, good question. Ooh, I, that depends a bit on the species. So if we're thinking of a cocoon being that kind of like cover over the pupa, um, like you have in moths, um, there are some flies that have that. Um, but not all of them do. So it depends a lot on the species. Some of them are just the naked pupa and some of them have some sort of container for that pupa. I guess being underwater, putting a, a covering around you could change the way you float or attach yourself to the surface or stick to underwater vegetation to, mm -hmm. to finish growing into an adult. It can also change how you breathe. If you are something that requires flowing water to um, get your oxygen, you need that water flowing over you a particular way to be able to breathe. And so um, things that do have cocoons, like I should do that black fly that has that kind of case that they use to cement themselves down onto the rock. Um, that's kind of sort of a cocoon, not exactly, but um, that helps flow the water around their bodies a little bit um, and keeps them in place. So to clarify, Kate's asking, so the ones who don't have a covering just change into an adult out in the open or in the water? Uh, yeah, it depends a little bit on the species. So like I showed you the mosquito, you know, those float at the surface as pupa. And so they just come straight out into the air. Some others will actually emerge as adults underwater and then swim up to the surface and crawl out of the water and then finish hardening when they're on land. Uh, it depends a bit on the species. Some of them will crawl out of the water or kind of um, be really close to the surface and get out of the water entirely before they they turn into adults. Um, so it does depend a bit on the species. All right, there you have it. Well, Chris, thanks again very much. Well, thank you. I love talking about these animals and making people aware of them. So I'm glad all of you were here today. Hope you're having a good bug fest. I know you're having a good bug fest. You always do. Oh yeah, I love bug fest. <laughs> so, and I want to thank uh, everybody for being a part of our bug fest program today too. Don't forget you can sign up for more bug fest programs that are happening today and tomorrow at bugfest.org. Uh, visit the site, see what's coming up. We've added a couple of new programs 
to the roster too. So there's a couple of last minute additions. So check out the website, see the ones that you like, go ahead and register. We hope we'll see you again. And don't forget that since Bugfest is virtual this year, you can actually pre-order the Bugfest shirt, which means that you can get one in your favorite color. So make sure you hit up the website and place your order for your favorite color of the ever popular Bugfest t-shirts. And if you join or renew your museum membership, you can get that cool Bugfest t-shirt for free. And of course, it supports the Museum of Natural Sciences. So thanks very much. I want to extend a special thanks to Terminex and BASF for sponsoring Bugfest this year. And Chris, thanks again to you for, for being with us and presenting today. Yeah, thank you. Happy to do it. All right, everybody. Take care. Have a great Friday. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.